I mean, it really reminds me of when Davy and I got started in radio. There were no rules, really. I mean, when we started working with um, NPR, we were doing 22-minute pieces. You know, I mean, come on, that's totally unheard of. The fact that podcasting exists gave us a venue. I decided to go back to guys I dated who turned me down and asked them why. And, uh, <laughs> and I did a whole series about it. But that's, I think, precisely the kind of thing that, like, I couldn't do in radio because, I mean, first of all, there'd be some editor, there'd be somebody saying, uh, nah, this is not what we do, right? This is amazing. It's a remarkable space. Um, Kickstarter has been transformative, of course, beyond expectations, but within public radio, within our niche, um, this has also become a fundamental part of how we think about connecting with audiences and the business models for independent production. I'm Jake Shapiro. I'm the CEO of PRX, Public Radio Exchange. And we've got uh, six of our seven Radiotopians here with us. Benjamin Walker is playing hooky, um, evidently. Actually, he's teaching at Union Docs about how to do podcasting, so it's a worthy, <laughs> a worthy distraction. Um, but what I thought we would do is have a discussion about what we're all up to and start off by having each of you introduce yourselves and a little word about the show. So, want to start, Nick? Sure. Uh, My name is Nick Vanderkolk. Uh, I made a podcast called Love and Radio, which is about, uh, ultimately is about creating incredibly intimate experiences uh, and a level of intimacy that might be uncomfortable, but uh, is very appealing at the same time. I'm Nikki Silva. I'm one half of the Kitchen Sisters. My other half, Davia Nelson, is uh, gathering stories in Italy right now. Um, and our podcast is Fugitive Waves. And we've been uh, producing radio for many years together as a team. And this podcast is really a chance for us to do a lot of the things that we haven't been able to do on air in the time constraints and to really kind of push it out there and use a lot of the great stories and lost sounds and shards of sound that we um, that usually hit the cutting room floor. Uh, I'm Joe Richman, Radio Diaries. Um, we say we like to tell the extraordinary stories of ordinary life, and we do that with, we do chapters of history, portraits, and we're sort of best known for giving people tape recorders and working with them to do stories about their lives. And similar to Nikki, uh, been doing stories for NPR for many years, but the podcast has been an incredible experience over the last year or two to just rethink what we do and frame it differently and, ex and play and do things that we couldn't do uh, in the context of, say, All Things Considered. I'm Jonathan Mitchell. I produce a podcast called The Truth. Uh, we call it Movies for Your Ears. It's like um, short films without pictures. Uh, so it's a very cinematic approach to radio drama, uh, very modern, contemporary take on radio drama, and trying to find a way to uh, create stories that feel relevant to a contemporary audience but are fictional. I'm Leah Tao. I have a show called Strangers Podcast, and it's uh, good old-fashioned storytelling. I go for stories that are exceptionally funny or exceptionally moving from people's lives and try to get to a level of honesty and intimacy that you don't often get to with strangers. My name is Roman Mars. I'm the host and creator of 99% Invisible. It's a show about architecture and design and all the invisible parts of the built world. So we're clearly in some sort of a moment around podcasting. It's been, you know, we're out of a tradition of public radio in many cases, and um, podcasting itself was invented easily a decade ago, and we've had sort of various runs at it. Um, but we've all embarked on this journey together. We launched Radiotopia only nine months ago, and now we're seeing this flourishing both of other networks and more shows and more audiences and even a potential business model that um, connects the crowdfunding with sponsorship. Um, but describe to me, or just jump in on the question of, of why you think podcasting has become a new pathway for yourselves. Me? Go for it. Um, well, I think, I mean, it's, it's, I think we were really privileged. I mean, there was always this notion that audio was the, the, the anachronistic, like, uh, old school way of making media. But 
in, in that sort of modern era of uh, multitasking and everything, I, I make the one thing that I guarantee you're doing something else at the same time you're doing, you're listening to me. So I don't, so if you have to write a long form article, that's the only thing you're paying attention to. You're watching a video, it's the only thing you're paying attention to. You are doing the dishes, you are driving in your car. You know, so I think that we're really suited towards the having, the, the key is a ubiquitous player of with like the iPhone and, um, and uh, the attention, you know, like you, you, that fact that you can sort of sneak in in different ways, that makes podcasting sort of like it, people really get it. And I think the other part of it is they're more comfortable with, the, like podcasting is still probably about three steps too many to be really, um, you know, like mass uh, like acceptance. Um, but I think that people are more familiar with their devices and they don't mind getting an app and stuff like yeah. that. I, I don't. I think that helps a lot. I feel like in, in some ways, I mean, Netflix has taught everybody that everything is available on demand. You press it and watch. Yeah. Um, and it used to be you had to sync your iPod to your iTunes and manage a playlist and have chords. Um, and now we've sort of shifted beyond that. But what is it about story and audio, too, that, that drives that? I was going to say from a production standpoint, podcasting is really appealing because um, you have access to a worldwide audience instantly. And so you're able to create uh, content that maybe might usually generally be appeal to a niche. But because it's, you know, everyone in the world accessing at once, you can actually build a substantial audience and find a way to sustain it. Um, so that, that's, that's the appeal to, to me. Um, as far as audio and story, I think audio is just so intimate. You know, you um, it's you know right in your ear, and you um, because it's missing information because you you're forced to imagine what a person looks like. The person you imagine is going to be like you're going to compare it to people you know who sounded like that, and so the person that you imagine is going to look like someone who's kind of familiar to you, and there's like an instant familiarity to audio because you're. You're, you're basing the images in your mind on things you already know. Joe, do you have a line on that in terms of audio and story and why that's? I was going to say, just, just a twist on what you were saying about the large audience. I mean, the difference for us sometimes having a story that airs and all things considered for a general audience that we don't really connect with, the difference between that and the podcast where there are audience and we can kind of talk to them in different ways. And I mean, that's just opened up a whole new world. And that's really exciting. To, to in a sense have well, it's, it, you know, to have our audience. Where do you where do you end up feeling that? So I mean, so yes, you 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 and, and Nikki actually both of you have had tremendous success as independent producers um, have, with stories that appear on shows like All Things Considered in front of 10, 20 million people. Um, where do you end up feeling this shift as you're focusing on your own voice within this to an audience? Uh, how does that become palpable? I, I mean, you, I think you can feel it in things like, you know, response from listeners and social media and things like that. But I feel it mostly myself in just how I approach stories differently and the sort of, you know, the, the, the sandbox that's all of a sudden given to you to say, don't just create a piece for an existing frame, but create your own frame too. I think it's the audience that is is most interesting to me. It's a completely different audience, I think, than um, NPR and All Things Considered. And you know, my younger friends, my kids, they don't even know how to find a show that we're like. If I say I'm on Morning Edition tomorrow, they go, Yeah, well, how else can I hear it? You know. So, I mean, I think it's 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 really appealing to kind of get out there to this new this whole new world and to be figuring it out and experimenting with. I mean, it really reminds me of when Davey and I got started in radio. There were no rules, really. I mean, when we started working with um, NPR, we were doing 22-minute pieces. You know, I mean, come on, that's totally unheard of. And it, we were figuring it out as we went. And this is, is like going back to that moment um, of public radio where, where we began, which is, is thrilling, really. Nick, you, you've had sort of one foot in radio and one foot in podcasting for a long time. Is there a sense that you have about targeting an audience with what you do or, or ways that it doesn't fit within the normal frame of public radio? Well, I, I think the, the real advantage with podcasting is, is I think it's, it's ultimately a more intimate experience than you get with radio. Like radio, you'll be doing a dial scan, you'll come across something, and you might have like a nice moment here and there, but with podcasting, like someone has, has chosen to listen to you, they're listening to you from start to finish so you can spend more time like creating slower builds. Like it's in a way it's, it's almost closer to doing cinema than it is doing normal radio. 
and I think that's something that's really exciting about it, and I, I, I prefer it. <laughs> yes, and, and Nick, you've also played with the edges of what's possible, I mean, part of what we're either reacting against or coming out of is the constraints of, of broadcast. Partly that is the infamous clock, which is literally the sort of infrastructure of how an hour of radio appears. Part of it is the literal FCC constraints on language and topicality. Part of it is what you've said too, which is that inherently broadcast is trying to reach a mass audience. So niche topics or particular angles are never gonna be accepted um, onto public radio. And in a sense, we're reinventing some forms. Uh, Jonathan, you, you tackled a, a tricky one, which would be surprising to most that you're able to reinvent or think about radio drama, which is archaic as a, as a notion in many ways, and you've come up with a whole new way to do it. Yeah, well, I always thought it had tons of potential. It sh there should be lots of radio drama in the world. It's just, a, you, it's just finding the way that, a way to do it that speaks to a contemporary audience. And so uh, my idea was to um, approach it in a way that, like I use impro improvisers and I use the, the editing of a, of a recording studio to, um, to make uh, improv improvised dialogue feel very written. Um, and so there's a lot of invisible elements to what I'm doing that make it feel like it's, it, it happened in a way that it didn't, totally didn't, like much like a film. But, um, I, you know, when I was starting to um, do this show, I, originally my idea was to do it within the public radio system. I've been working in public radio for 15, 16, 17 years. And um, I thought, you know, I could, I could pitch the show to a, a, a station or a, a distributor and, and, and I'd get a little bit of money and I could do it. And it took a long time to figure out that that's, that wasn't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, um, I found a group of actors who were, were into what I was doing or what, what I wanted to do and were willing to work for free. And uh, I was willing to work for free because I really believed in this idea. And we just started doing it and the fact that podcasting exists gave us a venue uh, to explore this idea and to sort of uh, uh, establish or find out its worth, maybe prove its worth, and, um, and here we are today. So. Leah, do you want to talk a little bit about your journey into this um, from the moth to what you've been doing with your own show? Well, you know, so I ran the storytelling organization, The Moth, for many years, and um, tried to get it on the radio for about eight years and every door was slammed in my face. Um, and I was told, you know, the storytelling market in public radio is already fully saturated. <laughs> There's not room for another storytelling show. Um, and so then we were like, all right, let's just start a podcast and put our stuff out there that way. And from the success of the podcast then ended up being able to create a public, a national radio show, which is unusual in radio to go straight to national with PRX. And so um, that was my first experience with podcasting. And I was like, this is great. And when I left there and wanted to continue working in storytelling and had kind of fallen in love with radio, um, I'm the, in terms of as a producer, I've been producing radio not as long as all of these guys, but I've worked in the storytelling field for a long time. And I was really wanted to work in that medium because of the intimacy, because it is so perfect for storytelling. And I thought, well, I think podcasting is the way to go. Yeah. And so, but with um, with strangers, talk about the shift you've had towards um, the series of uh, that you were describing last night, the the Love Hurts mini series within that. How how do you think about that as something that's drawing in an audience? You've had a whole new audience outpouring as a result. I think. Yeah, so I did this series recently about my own love life, and mostly on the show so far, I've featured other people's stories. But I, I was trying to figure out like what goes wrong for me and why I can't seem to find a relationship since I had a, a bad breakup some years, a few years ago. And uh, so I decided to go back to guys I dated who turned me down and asked them why. And, uh, <laughs> and I did a whole series about it. But that's, I think, precisely the kind of thing that like, I couldn't do in radio because, I mean, first of all, there'd be some editor, there'd be somebody saying, uh, nah, this is not what we do, right? But also, I wouldn't feel comfortable getting that personal uh, on the radio. But in podcasting, you really have this relationship with your audience, like you know them and they know you and they're rooting for you. And so you can get much more personal. And I think that's, that's amazing, yeah. So, um Jonathan, you were talking about you know, the, the start of this, um, you know, the actors were working for free, you were working for free. Um, one of the things that we've sort of 
built Radiotopia 4 and, and has been a mission of PureX is to try to see if we can actually create a sustainable model, quote unquote sustainable, for independent production in this world. Um, what has been, so what, what has been the business model for independent producers and do you think you see one emerging? I think we hope there is, but what is it now that we're shifting into podcasting? Who wants to jump in? I see there as being three revenue sources for podcasting. One is uh, listener donations, the other is advertising, and the, uh, the, the third is grants and, and um, foundation support. Um, and so we're you know, just exploring all three of those avenues. And I think um, Roman could probably speak more to this. Is it's about building a connection with your audience and making, making something that they're, they really love and want to support and, and value in a regular way, ongoing way. And, um, and you know, if you can, you can, you can create that re relationship with an audience, then, you know, they're probably going to be there for you. It's interesting because that, uh, those, those three revenue sources have been the three legs of the stool for public radio for a long time, so, you know, membership and listener support, sponsorship and corporate underwriting, and then philanthropy or, or government support. And of course that in traditional public broadcasting was all channeled through <coughs> the network of stations. Now, stations have been the sort of bedrock node of the network. Um, and it's interesting that that same model is gravitating towards independent producers who then are recentering it around their own shows, their own voice and their own audience. Yeah. I mean, I was, I feel like, so this is my third Kickstarter campaign. Um, and my training ground was a decade of asking people for money on public radio. <laughs> and if I didn't have that, I wouldn't know how to do this. And so it's it's related, but there's something about the energy of these Kickstarter campaigns that are really, they just, it gets the audience going in a way that a pledge drive, I've never seen a pledge drive work in that way before. And so um, I was amazed the first time I, so one of the great things is we have this audience, if, if they're public radio uh, savvy audience, they are used to being asked for money, and so they're comfortable with it. Um, uh, and if they're, but I get a lot of responses of people like I've never given to a public radio station before, and so I don't think we're taking an audience away from anybody or, or money away from anybody. Um, but I was the most surprised at the in, when when I did the first campaign, the most common response was, "Thank you for allowing me to give you money." which I had never heard before in my entire <laughs> life. And, and so, and, and then when I was like, the next year when I was doing the next one and we were trying to change the show and, and do it weekly, um, it, it, it happened again. And I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I can't go back again. And, and they were like, no, when's the next one? You know, like it was, it was really fun and it's different. So if that's true, why is this, so you described this as your last Kickstarter? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I really believe in Kickstarter being about a, a, a pivot or a project. You know, like it, it's, about, it's about that sort of thing. And right now, you know, the first 99% the first Invisible campaign was about, like, should 99% Invisible exist? The second one is, should it become a sort of professional organization? Should we come out weekly? Should we have deadlines? Should we have healthcare coverage? All that sort of stuff. And the third one was trying to like, can we create this ecosystem, um, you know, that supports a bunch of people, and they all make sense and they're progressive and they make sense. Um, the, the I can't. The thing I want to do next is I want to kind of pull back and focus on my show a little bit <laughs> again, and and so. I don't have a pivot point. I don't have a thing I want to change about my show. I just want to do my show for a while. And to me, like that's not in the spirit of Kickstarter. Right. And so that that's that's the and so I have to figure out what's next. But I don't think I have the the passion to like go to people and say this is what you need to support now. Right right now it's just like I just want to sustain. And so it and so I you know Kickstarter was everything to me. I mean like it totally made my show. Um, it wasn't existing as a public radio show. So. Uh, I'm, you know, and it's, and like, I'm addicted to, I have, I have fun with these. I mean, they're really hard, but I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I haven't slept in like about a week and a half, <laughs> you know, and I'm like high as a kite right now. So like, I'm, so I'm good, but, but, uh, so like, it's hard to let that go because you get used to the, that drive, to but it's, but campaigns. it's very, very, <laughs> but it's, but they're very draining. I mean, they're, they're hard work. And I really, when I consult with about, doing Kickstarters, I, I warn people like, 
Yeah. This is your job. So um, with this one that we're in the midst of, um, the idea there, it's tied to what you're just saying, is to establish Radiotopia to actually make it something that is viable and expansive and inclusive. Do you want to talk a bit about actually where that you know, vision started? Actually, we talked a bit about it last night, um, the, the arc of where we first got the instinct that this might be the new model right. and then where we see it going. Well, we, we had um, had this PRX retreat right after my first Kickstarter. So the first Kickstarter, like, I had no idea what was going to happen with that. I just thought, if I don't raise money, I'm gonna go broke. And so we did that and it, and it ended up exceeding, like it, we got about 400% of what we asked for. And, uh, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, maybe this could work. Maybe something small, as long as you don't have this overhead, could be funded um, by the crowd and make, it, and make it work. And so when we were at that retreat, it was like, well, what, what if we, you know, like, I don't think I'm unique in this. I think that there's, I, I know all these different people and really talented producers. And if we could find the right audience and sort of help curate and bring them in and sort of export the business model to them of, of all these, of the different legs of the stool, then they could all support themselves. And, uh, and, it, and it was, you know, it was like really important to me that everyone was autonomous. It was a collective. It wasn't the same kind of network. I didn't want to own a piece of anything. I just wanted us all to work together to do it. And, and, and that's, you know, to me it was really, that was about what public radio was about. And so I just wanted to recreate public radio in a way where it was driven by, you know, really creative independent producers who could find an audience and really engaged and curious listeners. And, uh, and that's, to me, was this notion of Radiotopia, like this nice world of radio that you were like recreating radio again. So. What's been, so for those of you who then joined the, the journey after uh, Roman and Pyrex began it, what's been your experience in Radiotopia? Oh, it's been amazing because, I mean, there's so many advantages to podcasting that people have already talked about compared to public radio, but the one disadvantage, right, is that people have to find your show. Uh, they don't just turn on their car or turn on the radio in their kitchen and there you are, so they have to find you, right? So if people... Um, that whose shows I love and listen to and admire go on their show and say, hey, you should also check out Strangers. That's like the kind of marketing that money can't buy, you know? So I just think, for, and then also banding together for fundraising purposes. I mean, it's tripled my audience and yeah, revenues, <laughs> so I'm pretty happy. I think it's, uh, for, for me, a lot of the collaboration and just kind of, I mean, we've all sort of kind of known each other, but... This has been wonderful. I mean, we have these telephone calls that are just like wild, you know, every month and <laughs> epic <laughs> phone calls and just hearing everybody's ideas and pushing it out there and going, oh yeah, okay, maybe we could do that. And just sort of sharing that uh, kind of sense of community I've really found valuable. And That's one thing you don't get as an independent producer for many years, you don't really feel part of a team. Yeah. And there's something really nice about that. It's great. Um, so we were talking a little bit about how we, in a way, have shifted away from the, the rules of, of radio. Um, do you start to sense what the new, are there new rules of podcasting? Are there things that actually you think are becoming the expectations or forms that we now are learning are working or need to design around? What's, what's a pod, what, you know, it, this, this ties to also the question of like an audience of new podcasters are saying, how do I do this? But are there rules of podcasting? Uh, I hope not. I mean, that, <laughs> I I mean don't that's know kind of the beauty of it. That format. unexpected. You know, well, I mean, there's like, what's, what's great about it is it's so free from constraint that it allows for a lot of bad things to happen. So, <laughs> so I'm glad that I had my time in public radio and edited, you know, severely. And, because, I mean, the most common complaint I get is my show is too short. Mm -hmm. And... My response to that is like, but if it was as long as you wanted it to be, you wouldn't like it. You know, like, it, tr trust me, <laughs> it's not like you want more of it because I edited it so tightly. Right. But like, I think the danger is if you don't have that sort of uh, history or discipline or like crafted stories before, um, you just go on there and you just think, I have unlimited, there's no constraints, we can just go, you know. So... I, I like sort of artificial, just taste constraints. But if, that, if that's all there is, then that's, that's fantastic. I, yeah. you, you decide your own constraints, too. Yeah. That's, the, that's what's really nice about it. Um, it it's, it's nice to know that there's a place where people, the, the constraints can evolve depending on what a 
an individual producer needs for their work. I think Davia was alluding to this earlier, but you know, when in the seventies, when pub, the public radio system was starting out, um, it really had, didn't know what it was supposed to sound like, and so they were just kind of throwing every idea at the wall, and some of it sounded like crap, but some of it was just really amazing and inspiring. And then at a certain point, you know, it it all just tightened up, and they decided that they were going to become much more of a small C conservative organization and not take as many risks. So I think that's that's the period we're entering now is one where there are more risks that are happening. There are the the constraints are breaking down and people are are figuring those out and, and those are evolving. It's it's funny, the baseline drift, like I'm so used to hearing you guys that I <laughs> I I forget how weird you are. You know? <laughs> and so like so like Love and Radio was featured on This American Life. And it was just shocking to me. Like I was like, I was like, this totally this fits perfectly. And then I heard it and I was like, this well, well this sounds really different than rest yeah. of this American life. And I, I just forget that we've like evolved so much more in different ways and explored in different ways. And I'm, I adore this American life. But I mean, it's just like it was really, I was really noticed it. And that's the part of it I love. And I f kind of forget because I'm so steeped in this world of more experimental audio and, and stuff. It's really great. I was going to say, it's sort of similar. I, I, the strength of this is also a weakness because although um, it's so great that people are choosing you, they're actively choosing this stuff, there is something wonderful about people stumbling on something. And like in the context of, say, a, a network news program, they hear something really weird. And that would be something I'd be really interested to figure out how that happens. Partly that it happens with a network like this, where people are going to find some shows that they wouldn't otherwise find. But I think to have that kind of stumbling quality where people get things that they didn't know they wanted, I think is part, part well, of the I think challenge. I too that with Radiotopia, we've been on these epic phone calls saying, oh, okay, and kind of coming up with ideas and saying, why don't we all just feature a little bit of everybody else on our our podcast, not just say their names, but here, this is what somebody's, you know, like releasing this week, and you can hear it. Here's a little preview, which I, I think is just a great idea. And that's, I think, what can come out of a collective like this. And hopefully, I love that too. It's like newspapers, finding that article you never looked for, that little unexpected treat that we have to figure out a way to do that um, with the podcast. So it's not a real purposeful thing always. It's really interesting because that is this, um, I mean, it's an overall internet and media phenomenon and tension between the serendipity of what you could discover versus this sort of filtered bubble of choosing the things that already conform to your tastes. And um, radio on the broadcast sort of channel has been the curated experience around all that and has all those benefits that you say. And I think the interesting competitive uh, need when you're just out there as a story in the ether is you're now competing for attention, not just with anything else on the dial, but anything else that you could consume on your phone, which you know, it could be a Spotify playlist or just like scanning through, you know, the newspaper. And, and that's, that's kind of what I was getting at, too, with what is the new pressure on how you think about reaching an audience. We're just at the beginning, I think, of feeling that. Um, and there's not a lot of a feedback loop yet. We don't have a lot of visibility yet into, and you, know, you were saying, you know, I'm producing a story and I know you're washing the dishes. You know, <laughs> like they're not factoring some of that in. Um, but I'm curious if you guys have thoughts about where you'd hope the form goes. I mean, you know, where is innovation coming in podcasting? One thing I have to add uh, is uh, I feel like if I, um, you know, my show is ostensibly a radio drama show, and I feel that if I align, were aligned with only radio drama podcasts, my podcast would be appealing to people who are going to type in radio drama into Google, you know? And and how many people is that going to be? <laughs> you know? We can tell you. We can do a little, little trends. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I, I felt like, it'd be, you know, aligning myself with uh, people who aren't doing that, who but but who are doing really creative audio, uh, will, you know, who who um, produce audio for people who I, I feel are also potentially my audience. Um, that's the that's the way to really expand what I'm doing into a larger. I think audience. like social media really is kind of the, the if we can make it really really easy. And really easy for people to send, you know, oh, you got to see this, you got to hear this, you got you to be part of this, and also give people this way to get to the podcast easily. I think that's where we could really make a huge impact, you know? I mean, I don't think it's easy enough yet. I don't, you know, I constantly, people say, well, how do I, what do I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I thought there was this, uh, you know, the, the 
there was a moment where it felt like actually in the last month, even this mainstreaming tipping point of podcasting had happened. We'd had the launch of Serial, which Serial. is this American Life's new podcast only show, a great fanfare. Um, we've had Radiotopia with our campaign. Um, we've had Alex Bloomberg's new company that he's starting just as a podcast production company. And I think when um, Ira Glass was on The Tonight Show, you know, sort of back to back, um, Robert Downey Jr. and then like Ira Glass talking about podcasting. And they actually showed the video of him and his 85 year old neighbor because they had to explain when they were introducing Serial, they said a lot of people still were like, podcast, I don't know how to get that. I don't know where to listen to it. So his 85 year old neighbor demonstrating on an iPad how to hit play. <laughs> um, and I was all right, it's arrived. Podcasting may have a moment of sort of mainstream acceptance in that way. Um, because we have this public radio context, um, one of the things that I wanted to sort of call out and ask about, um, there's two kind of camps that I'd love to get Radiotopian's advice towards. One would be up and coming independent producers who want to follow this path, but also this, uh, the set of institutions that we've all had a lot of benefit from allegiance to, which is stations. You know, you, for example, are working with KCRW. Yeah. Um, you know, we have strong stations that we've partnered with in various ways, but how do they fit in, if at all? to this anymore, and what do you think their role is now that the shift is happening? Incubators. Okay. I, mean, I just really feel like public libraries, they just have to be, there has to be in every community a public radio station where people can come in with their ideas and, and learn the craft and, uh, and hopefully then make the leap into whatever, podcasting, um, you know, national broadcast, local. I mean, please don't lose local. We need people doing local stuff. And um, I think that's where the stations fit in. I don't want to lose the stations. And but I think they're really paying attention. I think the whole public radio establishment is noticing what's happening in podcasting and the creativity and the fundraising potential there. And they realize that everything is moving to on demand, right? Or a lot. And, and people are going to want to just play whatever they want to hear when they're in their car, not whatever's on. So I think the smart stations um, are figuring out how can we be a part of that and think beyond just traditional broadcast, but partner with podcast only shows. So yeah, I'm affiliated with KCW in LA, the NPR affiliate there, but I've talked to two independent producers in the last two weeks who called me for advice because they were trying to negotiate deals with much smaller public radio stations in this country who want it to partner with and help fund their podcast only show and figuring out A, you can do things that are podcast only and B, you can still maybe let the producers own it and have a partnership and not say we have to be the institution and it's our thing. And I think that's really exciting. I have a question sort of, well, for everyone, but for you, Jake, too. I mean, one of the ways that things are being blurred, we keep talking about public radio up here because we all come from public radio on some level, but with the podcast, that distinction gets blurry and what is what makes public radio public radio the sort of the commercials that are on you know th these things are that's one of the things that I'm confused about and trying to figure out as we go it's like what are the important things that I love about public radio that make it you know the non-commercial and all those sort of things that make it different from something that is just a commercial enterprise and that's getting blurry yeah it's fascinating I mean this is and this has been part of PRX's path and all of this which is to try to redefine the term public radio and make it more expansive and inclusive. And we've had one foot in the tradition of public radio as a broadcast medium and then the internet. And we think there's a lot they could learn from each other. And that ends up boiling down to, in, in my view, um, the purpose and, and mission uh, and who's producing it and the people behind it. Because no longer is the constraint or sort of the rules enforced through FCC or through CPB funding or through these sort of mechanisms that essentially were like credentialed ways of establishing public radio, we now have an opportunity and a need to define it um, for ourselves. That non-commercial non nature is actually a really interesting thing because we've ported over some parts of the public radio expectations, um, even without having to, um, how we treat sponsorship messages, how we make these appeals to listeners. And I think this corner of the podcast universe, because there's a, there's a whole other side of podcasting that operates differently, I think is actually helping define public radio in this new medium. It's funny that it's, it's yeah. become like a, an aesthetic yeah. uh, definition, right? Because right? it has absolutely nothing to do with the, like how it's funded or like anything else. It's just it's just aesthetics. So I think we're uh, we're nearing the uh, time where we'll switch over to some Q and A from the audience. Um, let's go ahead and do that. If you have a question, just wait for me to bring you the microphone. So. 
Uh, so a couple of you mentioned the intimacy of podcasting. Um, and to me, it seems like podcasting at, at, of all the new media is one of the least intimate in terms of like in New York, oftentimes people are doing it on the subway and they have headphones on or you're doing it in your car. Um, and it's harder to interact with the, with the people who are creating it. So, so what are some examples of how you see podcasting as being particularly intimate? I mean, I, I would say I'm, uh, part of what's missing from podcasting is the it's not it's not interactive. So part of what you're getting at is I think that um, there is a missing piece of the sort of social interaction that you see in other types of media, certainly in social media, but even in sort of forms of video and photo and text that are shared in that way. With this infamously, um, we've talked about audio not being a viral medium in the same way for particular reasons, which we think are actually pluses in some ways about about its nature, but I think you were getting something different about the word intimacy. I don't, I don't find social media intimate at all. I, audio, I feel, I find incredibly intimate. I mean, this, I mean, radio, but especially podcasting. And you know, radio, it, it is this idea that it's in your living room, it's in your bedroom. You have this one-to-one -one connection with the talker. All that stuff that we have known, kind of, you know, is, kind of informs our work. But podcasting right there in your ear is yeah. just such a. IV into your brain and your heart um, that I think there's some, really something unique, I think, about audio, audio only that kind of sticks in a way that Jonathan was kind of alluding to earlier. And you think about, like, I mean, usually people are mic'd just a few inches away, and if you're listening to your headphones, I mean, you are, you're just a few inches from the person who's speaking to you. Like, how, how often do you, you can whisper to have somebody. that experience? Yeah, you can whisper and to someone. And it's right there. Yeah. And, and you don't even notice it. Like, like I was... I was talking to a, a public radio station who was telling me why I wasn't appropriate for their air, and um, <laughs> and it, and a little bit of the tone of it, and I, I, I was like, that's perfect. It works perfectly on public radio. What are you talking about? I made it for public radio, but like, just even just the miking and the style of it, and the way that I have in jokes, and the way I say you, I don't. I use second person most of the time. You, you don't tend to do that on, you know, in journalism and public and, and radio. And the result of that, sorry, is that we under, we feel like we get to know those people in a way that I yeah. don't think we do in any other medium. And so. they and we do. I mean, they people contact us in in large numbers. But I think to your point, I think we could use somebody in the tech community building a better platform for podcasting. I'm um, I'm just curious. Listening to you speak about the distribution and the, the way you've kind of embraced the medium, I look at the music industry and how it's fought so hard against that. And then I see how much you are like in love with and fully letting people like give to you and like, you know, contribute and using Kickstarter and using these digital distribution things. Does that come from being involved in public radio and like, getting involved with audiences rather than it being this kind of cast down upon the like sort of an in industry based thing. Cause it seems like a very different approach to like embracing an audience versus what I think music has been like forcing upon audience. I'm just curious, like, yeah, is that a, a mentality? Uh, I mean, I think it's, a, there's several factors. One is that there was no, is no public radio model that's being disrupted in the same way. There was no CD sales, um, you know, there was no, you know, tickets to go to movie theaters. There's definitely disruption waiting in the wings, which is mostly around the connection to listeners directly to these kinds of folks um, in terms of the traditional model. But it's also been that there's an alignment around both the mission, which is trying to serve and get out audio and stories and have impact and make sure information is available, and then the business model, which follows along that. So if the business model is, you know, sponsorship and underwriting, which is very much tied to audience and reach, and then this, this crowdfunding and the listener donations, that's very much aligned to say, like, let's take full advantage of any possible distribution to reach an audience where they're listening. And there isn't, to the point of a film or, or music um, and books even, there are, the rights problems aren't there. These folks produce what they do. They own what they do. They, you know, the, the, there aren't third-party you know, windows of distribution and you know, festival circuits and commercial cable news network. I mean, it's a very different, much more open basis for it. So no, no one goes into public radio for money. <laughs> yeah. To shift to something else that makes like well, the, the a little bit of money, yeah. no but money too. Like, yes. <laughs> Suddenly, I, I had no, I had no money to lose. I mean, it was really, it's totally true. I think that's one thing, and I think that there's a little bit like I think that I think we're mission-driven people, and I, I think it's, 
It's a little bit different that way. Um, I don't know. And it's a fun, it's a privilege to do the work. I, Most I, people work to make money, and we try to make money so we can work. Yeah. Another question? Thank you guys for being here. It's really cool. Um, so it's Pledge Week on WNYC right now. And every morning hearing it, you know, they, they do a lot to try and make it like interesting and fun, but it's so painful. Um, and it's so like weird and, and kind of like guilt based. And I'm just wondering if you think that that is, will be here forever. Like will, will, will public radio always do pledge drives or do you think that they will ever think about uh, other models? I, I think they probably will. I think so. Will what? I think they'll. I think they'll. Think they'll no, I think they'll do pledge drives forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, the problem is, is, is they really, they still really work, um, but they, you know, like, but I, I, I think that um, one of the things that I liked about Kickstarters is it's a really joyful experience, and I think that if they pivot towards making a, a joyful experience, even the pledge drive will seem better. Um, but they have done this, like. At KQED, where I'm from in San Francisco, they started. If you pledged, you you could get this online pledge only feed of of pledge free, which I think actually is almost too transactional. Like I don't think that that's actually a good idea. But um, so I think they're thinking of other models, and they would try. And I, I hear that a lot from my first campaigns, which were like, why doesn't everyone just do this? Um, uh, but. I have, it's such the bedrock of how they make money that it would be really hard. Like that would be, that part of disruption would be very difficult is to switch off the, the pledge drive. I think maybe one more question. Yeah, so I'm curious whether this kind of more direct relationship you're describing with podcasting with your audience can and kind of the more kind of, kind of conversational tone you can have with them also extends to the way that you find yourself identifying content, are you getting more story leads and more ideas for actually what to have on the show from this audience that you're now able to kind of converse with more? Are you getting ideas from story, you know, for you story pitched. ideas from the audience? I get pitched every 20 minutes probably <laughs> yeah. on Twitter and stuff. I mean, totally. I, I get that all the time. 90% of my stories come from people contacting me, yeah. I get pitches a lot, but um, I, very few that I, I, I would want to do. <laughs> 90% um, of my pitches also don't work, but 90%, 80, 90% of my stories end up being from pitches, yeah. So I think we just have a couple more minutes. Um, and uh, one, one question I know would be a, a, one that an audience for this kind of a event would like to know would be podcasters who are up and coming. We saw some of them last night. We're saying, I want to get into this game. It's a very different feel from the moments we had in public radio where there's sort of an established pathway. But what is some of your advice? You're probably giving it oh, on always. the fly. So As give us a few, a few tips. Own your work. Always, like, get your, set up your show, get your voice, own your work. Go to someone with a fully formed thing and don't, and don't you know, like, it'll have greater value at that point. There's a... You're so alone as an independent producer that it's great comfort for like a station or somebody to say, no, you're good. And I will, I'll give you the, the change out of my pocket and, and I'll tell you you're good. And that's not enough. You can own your work, take a hit. You know, that, I, I, I really think that's the big deal. I, I would say take it one step at a time. I think a lot, of, a lot of people who ask me for advice are asking around like how to promote their podcast and they haven't even started making it yet. They don't even know what it sounds like. <laughs> so this is, you, you take it one step at a time, like figure out what you want to do, get, find your voice, then start wor worrying about building your audience and then start worrying about how you're going to pay for it. So think about what you wish existed in the world that doesn't already and make that. Something very specific, uh, get a good editor. I mean, my, all my work would suck if I didn't have really good people listening and critiquing and helping me. Well, I think I'd just say really play with it and experiment, because this is a, a chance to do that, a way to do that. And I mean, it's so easy to just kind of listen and go, I want to do something just like that. Well, that's already happening. So how can you push it out there and make it you? So I, I'd just say play with it, experiment, which I think in the early days of working with stations in non-commercial things where you could do your own show, um, 
you could really do that if you were doing a live show. You could play with it and see what was working. And I think the podcasts are a chance to do that too. Just start. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, what I'm it's so not complicated. You just work. And if you want it to be a job, work like it's your job until it is your job. That's the hard part of it. Mm -hmm. So in, in the hopes that this uh, video will appear during our um, actual campaign, which we're in the middle of, uh, Roman, do you want to talk a little bit about, as our last statement here, where we're expanding Pledge week on to Radiotopia. Pledge Week on Radiotopia. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, listeners like you, um, but we actually have like we have a challenge. There's a there's a specific backer challenge. Yeah, we're trying to get twenty thousand. Twenty thousand backers, backers right which now. we're now I think at around six thousand four hundred. We're about something. third so we away been, there. It's gonna be hard, but <laughs> we're gonna get that. I am excited about that. Um, we're trying to expand Radiotopia, invite more people in. Um, we have a, a, a few shows that we've uh, announced. You should mention them. Okay, so one of them is called Criminal. Uh, it's hosted by Phoebe Judge. Um, it's uh, investigative journalism uh, on, on, on the stories about crime, and it's really fantastic. Um, uh, Helen Zaltzman, who does this brilliant podcast I love called Answer Me This, is doing a new podcast for us. Um, we, we hope, uh, about words. Uh, we have lots of different names for it right now. I don't know what the, the leading one, we're talking about subtext or something, but it's about investigation of words and word origins and uh, the usage of, of, of language and, um, and the heart, which is uh, this one <laughs> from uh, uh, Caitlin Prest, who, do, who did this one called Audio Smut, and she's like redoing it, and, and uh, we're going to double the output is the idea of that one. And so um, we're... Really excited about uh, bringing them on. We're also really excited that one of the big problems in the world of podcasting and in on-air public radio is there aren't enough women voices. And so these are all uh, women-hosted podcasts. It would uh, make our, we would have gender equal equality on our, in our roster, which I'm super excited about. And so we're, all the different parts of my different campaigns on Kickstarter were about like fixing the things that I thought were wrong in public radio, like like I didn't have health care and and like they gave me health care and like all these sorts of things that I really wanted and um, and this is like one of those steps and just to make the the public radio system like we're going to recreate public radio the way it's like supposed to be. So but we have to blow through. We have to make the money though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like because we have to pay these people. That's how I was. Al yes. I always paid people, even yeah, when I had money no going money. Going I paid I mean, people. What is? What are we doing with the money we're raising? Well, I mean, this is. I mean, the, the hard part about a campaign like this, where we're all together, it's like fun to be all together, but you have to split it seven ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like it's not. It ends up, you know, going you, you, after you send out the t-shirts and stuff. Like it ends up being tough. So we have to raise enough money, and the idea is to give people a stipend so that they can make their work regular and make it their job and make it a priority. So we give everyone who joins Radiotopia, we give them a monthly stipend to sort of just keep things stable. And then on that platform, they can begin to raise their own money um, doing ad revenue based on what their downloads are and all sorts of things. So we just sort of provide the, this is like we're setting you up to go succeed. And uh, we can't pay for everything, but at least we can get you started. And, and that's what the, the money is for. Production is mainly time. There's a bit of equipment, travel, and stuff. But it really is about prioritizing your time. So, All right. I think we've uh, reached time. So I wanted to thank you all for, for joining us. And thank you for having us.